Okay, I hope uh, I hope you're all seeing uh, one slide again. Um, and I'll uh, introduce Connie Lucy, who uh, taught all our boys uh, everything they know about uh, the local Miwoks. She also uh, taught them uh, about uh, Rancho uh, Days and about Pioneer Days. So <laughs> she's our local uh, history uh, expert. And we've um, uh, reached the point where uh, uh, David Klenick uh, got us to the Vasco Caves. And now we're, we're up to just uh, before the Spaniards arrived. And Connie's going to uh, tell us about the, the Miwoks. She um, uh, uh, studied California history uh, while her husband, Al Loosely, was doing his uh, internship down in, in L.A. and has uh, uh, built on that uh, uh, over uh, the years, worked at the uh, Alexander Lindsay Museum uh, along the way. Uh, and Lawrence any... Hall of Science also. Huh? And Lawrence Hall of Science. And Lawrence Hall of Science. Their Indian program. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to sit uh, close to Connie so our microphone uh, picks up everything and not block the, uh, the screen for our local audience. Um, so take it away, Connie. <laughs> okay. First of all, John has this. Um... I'm not sure where this, where Tatcon Bay, Miwok Indians lived, but San Ramon Creek, obviously. So they were a little south of here, a little west of here, but probably Plains, uh, probably part of the uh, Bay Miwok people, which it says up there. Um, anyway, so I got very interested in Indians, partly because I have a, uh, uh, my parents were the foster parents and the guardians of an Indian girl who came to live with us when I was about six and she was about eight and she lived with us until she was 20 and had finished college and went off and uh, she was a Chickasaw from Oklahoma part of the Cherokee nation um, part of the uh, Trail of Tears, and uh, she was very helpful when I, uh, I was just fascinated by her whole stories and all the things she told me and the, all of the myths she told me, and she had only, she was in an orphanage, but she had learned a lot, and then she studied it later herself. She's the one who told me, by the way, that not all Indians like to be called Native Americans. She said, she said, why would we be called Native Americans? You're a Native American to me. You're born in America. What other are you native of? You know, <laughs> she said, we are American Indians. We like being called American Indians. We are American Indians because that was what we were first called when they came here. And it really meant natives. So she said, I like American Indians. So I seldom refer, refer to them as uh, Native Americans. I asked her this when I was about to do a thing called Indian Days for all the fourth graders in the Walnut Creek School District. I thought, can I call it Indian Days? Because people were saying, you can't call this Indian Days. And I said, okay. So I talked to her. It was Indian Days from then on. <laughs> no problem. Nobody gave me any trouble. So anyway, um, I wanted to start with uh, really the as far as is known the indians as we know them that that were in this part of the really all of california started back in 2000 the year 2000 that's the first time they have any not any of the uh archaeology things have shown that they were of the indian type of people you mean 2000 bc 2000 bc okay. yes okay. 2000 yeah. years ago and so, um, actually, actually, the first time, yeah, it was about, uh, yeah. And so they may have been um, in the San Francisco area from 1000 BC to 2000 BC, but nothing uh, any further inland before 2000 BC. And they are called prehistoric Indian groups. Um, the, air, the Indians that lived right here were Miwoks. 
and the Miwok tribes, and you can go to the first slide. So you'll see on the left, this is the Miwok tribes that, so you can see, um, you can, you oh, these are the Sierra and Miwoks on the left. On the right are the Miwoks, the Bay Miwok. You can see Walnut Creek. If you look at the slide on the right, it says Walnut Creek down on the left-hand side, lower part. So the Mi Bay Miwoks went just below us, and uh, but not as far as Pleasanton. And, and, and on up all the way to Sacramento and on up into, they were then, and, but the, it was the, Mi, the Bay Miwoks, and then it was the Plains Miwoks. And the Plains Miwoks were pretty much in the Delta area, and um, the Bay Miwoks were, were kind of outside the Delta area. What you have to understand is Miwok was a language group, not necessarily a nation. They never considered themselves to be a nation. It was really that they all spoke the same language base. They all had their own languages, but or their own dialects and their own languages, sort of as we might think of, you know, um, English being spoken by different parts of the country. Some are easier to understand than others. And um, so, th but they could all communicate. They also use sign language, big on sign language. And they had a, a mutual sign language that they all used if they were in this pole, all the way up into the Sierra Miwok, the and they're the ones on the left. So just above us were the Southern Sierra Miwok, the Central Sierra Miwok, and the Northern Sierra Miwok. And basically that was the, they were all of the same nation, nation kind of. Um, the, they lived in triblets and the triblets could be anywhere from 50 people to 200. They were usually small. They, they were probably primarily a family. So, and relations in that family. They did not intermarry within their tribelet. So they depended on going to gatherings to find the wives and husbands and, and going to gatherings for trading. They were, they were very peaceful. As far as among themselves, they were definitely peace, peaceful. They didn't need to fight. They didn't need to fight over territory because they had everything they needed. As, you, as we go on, you'll see that what they used were all things they could find. And they were very creative in how they used them. <laughs> and one area might use it a little bit differently, but basically they were all able to uh, live very well. There was plentiful game, plentiful plants. Um, they, they used everything they had in, in nature and around them. And they were also very good at conserving what they had. So they recognized right away, you know, if we fish out this creek and, and there's no, no little fish left, um, then we're not gonna have fish next year when we come here. They were not nomads, but they also were not um, uh, settled. They moved from one place to another as the resources changed. So obviously we have seasons here we seem like we only have the dry season now, but <laughs> there was a lot more rain and a lot more um, flooding then. So uh, the Miwoks here lived basically in the, down in the Walnut Creek Basin, where we have three creeks all run together, which were quite full. So we have the uh, San Ramon Creek, the um, Walnut Creek and Las Trampas. Las Trampas Creek. And all those come together down there. So that was great for the summertime, for their, for their summertime. It was not actually as hot down there because there were a lot of trees, because there were a lot of creeks. So they could live down there. But the minute the rain started, they moved up into this territory because this was above the, the flooding and still had creeks running and had lots of the other things that they needed. If it was a really bad winter, they would move up into the foothills of, of uh, Mount Diablo because they could uh, then use the big trees to build bigger shelters and be more protected. And they'd use the outcroppings of rock that are up on Mount Diablo 
to become almost like cave dwellers in really bad years. So that was kind of the way um, it went for them. We can go on to the next. So okay, you can just go by this. I don't know how this works. Anyway, so so the next slide is going to be to show you the Miwok. Um, oh, this is the uh, this is just a quick slide. This has the kind of the bay, Drake's Bay, and that area. That was a totally different kind of Indian, but I wanted to show that um, they they were um, the coastal Miwoks. So they also were in the same language zone as the ones up in here. They were uh, a very large tribe. The Miwoks, there were, they assume, and they have record of over a thousand triblets. And the triblets are small, as I said, but, but then those triblets, they have over a thousand actual records of those triblets. Um, records are kind of funny when you're dealing with early on, um, a lot of the population studies that they did were based on baptisms. Well, where could they get baptisms? Only at the mission. <laughs> so yes. baptisms were, uh, you know, kind of a funny way, but that was the only way they had of, of uh, aging. Um, so how many families in the tribe? Um, well, meaning one family, meaning one uh, genetically one, one group. However, um, as I said, they often lost people left to, to go to other tribes and then they brought in other tribes as spouses and then they became part of that tribelet and stayed there. Usually it never went back, even if their spouse um, died or something. Um, so they organized, they organized their, their, um, community, there was no central government per se. They had a chief. You can go on to the next one. Yeah. They had a chief in each one, but the chief was not, he wasn't like the head guy, actually. <laughs> he was the one who um, took care of disputes. He settled disputes. And so if there were, were people that were fighting against uh, arguing over something or disputing something. He was the wise man who sat and listened and kind of like a judge. And when he made his judgment, that was it. And um, if you didn't agree with the judgment, you could leave the tribelet or you could stay and agree to the, agree to what they say. And uh, <laughs> they, they uh, sometimes they would kick some out of a tribelet and just make them leave. They could join another another one and often did. Um, notice that the houses here are this is the typical Miwok house for the coastal and the Bay Area and even the uh, Plains Miwok. Once you get into the Sierra Miwok, you're going to see another type. But these were made with tules and with um, uh, willow. So they took willow, you know, willow bends, but it doesn't break. And so they would make upside down baskets out of large willows. Willows were everywhere. They were all along every creek, every, but large trees, they didn't uh, have really good ways of getting, and they did not have a lot of straight trees. They had a lot of oaks. And, and we all know oaks are not known for being straight and uh, definitely not uh, able to bend. So these were... And they were very waterproof because they would overlap their tules so that the rain hit the top and went down the sides. They had a uh, an opening in the top where the uh, smoke could go out, but it was also covered with tules that would take the rain away. And if it started dripping inside, they put a new layer of tules on top and filled their and patched it all up. Um, a family of maybe six or seven might live in a in a, that upside down basket there <laughs> um so everything was very much from what it said you can show the next one yes 
Abandoned and moved to just new yes. They, so, so one of the reasons it's been hard for archaeologists to make a lot of studies is that what they made, they would just abandon and um, they would fall apart and become part of the, you know, soil and everything. So it was hard. They did not, they didn't use bowls. They didn't make bowls. They didn't use bowls. They wove them. They wove baskets. So everything's basketry. Well, you know, baskets also dis disintegrate over time. And we'll talk a little more about their baskets. But um, this is a roundhouse. Roundhouse is like their um, ceremonial house. So though they moved around, each tribelet had a settlement. The settlement is where they had their roundhouse. They had maybe some, uh, The by the way, the the upside down houses were called wowies. <laughs> so their wowies um, might have a wowie or two, but it wasn't someplace where people stayed, but this is where they would come together. Um, their tribelet would gather here in the uh, round houses. And you can go, the round houses are, are also their dirt on top of a wooden structure that's underneath and covered with, uh, again, grasses. And they allowed stuff to grow on it. So it became even more uh, solid. Okay, so let's go to, in, this is the interior of a roundhouse. So you can tell they did a lot of work to make the interior of a roundhouse. The walls, quote unquote walls you see there, are, are uh, the clay mud, which we all as gardeners around here struggle <laughs> with, but they loved it evidently. Um, they also would go um, further toward uh up toward Davis area when they were trading and they would trade for the mud that came from there because that was a stronger clay. And so they used clay a lot and they baked it in the sun. They baked it in, um, they would put straw with it and they'd bake it in, in the sun to, to become hard enough to put on the walls. Um, so you can see, and this would be where they would gather. They gathered here for ceremonies, they gathered here for uh, celebrations, for meetings, for big storms, um, and if there were intruders or danger that they felt they needed to be hidden, most roundhouses were pretty well hidden. Uh, so, okay, the next one. Um, this, on the other hand, is a Sierra Miwok building, and you can see totally different, using totally different materials. And obviously, you have to realize that they used whatever they had. <laughs> and that was why they were so amazing at how uh, well they managed to make their communities last and um, how well they did. Okay, let's keep on going. So they used, as I said, what they had. Their main source of food was acorns. And when they'd go to trading with other places, like they had to go north to trade for obsidian up near um, up near Shasta or or St. Helena or something, and they would bring the obsidian down. Many of us here in this area find obsidian in our backyards. We find hidden obsidian in the open space. It's all been imported. <laughs> It's important. I thought some came from the east side too. Uh, maybe from the east side also, yeah, but not from. Not everybody either. thought Mount Diablo was a had been in a volcano, and not true. Yeah. It's totally yeah. push up. So uh, anyway, acorn granaries. So acorns were what they could take from here, and trade because we had all the oak, all the types of oak, the best kinds of oak, the blue oak the um, valley oak, the, um, there's about six, seven different kinds of oak, and they would separate them and divide them up. Like if you were a, at a farmer's market and you had the different kinds of peaches or you had different mm -hmm. kinds of whatever, mm -hmm. and they'd bring those to uh, the, the trading areas when they went to trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was their big uh, source of, of, that they could provide. When they gathered, they gather, it was easy to gather acorns. They just either had kids climb up in the, in the tree and shake the branches, or um, they just gathered around the bottom and waited till they fell. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so they were easy to gather. They would gather as many as they could, obviously, when it's acorn season. And then they would save them in these granaries. The granaries have an, an interior that is a, is a stick or actually usually two or three or four. And, and it has a, around the centerpiece where the, where the acorns are stored, it has uh, bay laurel usually that keeps the insects out. Um, and then it has other kinds of, of plants that will keep animals out. But they had to keep restoring that because there were certain plants that animals didn't want to didn't want to mess with. Because obviously that would be the people the the uh, that would be who they had to worry about thieves <laughs> being being animals that got in there, and they would save them and, and use them for everything. They used them for starting out. They used them for acorn mush and acorn mush had to be prepared by first breaking open the acorns and getting the nuts out. Then they, they ground them. And one of the few things that, that we find around and that we can use as archeology span are the grinding holes. Mm -hmm. And grinding holes are just, because we have primarily sandstone here, we also have a uh, little limestone and a few other things, but like granite, which we also have in our mountains here, Granite is not good for making a grinding hole out of because it doesn't make a hole. It chips off in pieces. So you need something like, like sandstone or something that as you grind, it makes the hole. You can imagine, and this is just a, an aside, that as you ground the acorns, you also ended up with a little bit of sand in there. And so they ate a lot of sand in their acorn mush and in their acorn products. Um, it was one reason why the elderly uh, ate primarily acorn mush and only the intestines of the animals because they didn't have any teeth. <laughs> a major problem for health. They had gr ground down a lot of their teeth. Yeah. So uh, they, and when I say elderly, I think elderly was probably about 45. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, um, so, that, I mean, they don't have ages of how, how long people lived or anything, at least not that I've seen. I'm sure there's something a little bit better, but, um, but really they talk about the, the young, they talk about the very young, the young, the mature and the elderly. <laughs> so I'm guessing elderly is about 45. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, acorns, once you'd ground them down, then you had to leach out the tannic acid which is uh, very bitter and uh, I guess could even make you sick probably if you didn't get it out. So they would have their basket and, and they would put it in their basket and they would pour water through it, hot, hot water. Now, hot water, how do you get hot water? Hot water <laughs> when it's a basket. You can't put a basket on the rocks. You have to take your stones, put those stones in the fire and your stones get really hot, you have a basket and you put your stone inside the water that's in your basket. They did make baskets that were waterproof, or at least somewhat waterproof. They made their very tight woven baskets and then they put a coating of the, our clay soil here. And then they put um, the root of um, the... Um, shoot oh the so the so, well soap root no soap root wasn't used for this one but the root of one of the plants i'll think of it um anyway they they put uh that they mixed that they they uh had that and that would form a very hard coating almost like a shellac kind of thing on the inside which would help to make these baskets waterproof they fill them with the water they take their hot stones and put them in stir the hot stones around until the water gets really nice and hot. They pour it through the basket that's loosely, loosely woven and uh, that the water can see, sift through. And that's one leaching. They had to be leached about five or six times. Get them clear. Then you could cook it. Then you could put the hot stones actually in with the, um, 
the mush and the mush itself would start to cook. Mm -hmm. And it was like hot cereal kind of. And they would put berries in it. They would put uh, seeds in it. They would put um, all kinds of things in it. They would also make them into almost like pancakes. Um, they called them biscuits, but they heat them on also the hot rocks. So the rocks would all be sitting around and they'd heat those on the rocks and then they'd, um, and then they'd uh, eat them. They um, also um, made biscuits out of them and cooked those in ovens, which were sort of like the roundhouse, dug out underneath the earth, uh, coated with, with a mud interior. And um, they would put them inside of there with a fire. Mm -hmm. So that was their oven. Um, they sometimes roasted meat but in their oven, um, but they frequently, they also roasted all kinds of insects in their oven. They love to eat grasshoppers. It's one of their, one of their uh, main insect sources of food. And so they would roast those in the, in the oven. Considered that a great delicacy. <laughs> at least the bay people had fish as well bay people had fish uh here they they went they went to um the uh uh all the you know the delta, delta area right. and all of that area but we also had creeks and these creeks actually had salmon in them <laughs> and many of the creeks mm -hmm. had salmon in the downtown creeks those still have salmon in them you know the walnut mm -hmm. creek still has salmon in them they find the salmon you know they Walnut Creek starts, I don't know where the headwaters are, but I know that um, they have found the salmon clear up, you know, like um, somewhere near the Delta where it starts. Well, I had a, uh, an Indian patient who went fishing in Walnut Creek for salmon. Uh -huh. And he, when he came in, uh, he'd come in, he'd give me a report on how his salmon fishing was going. Yes. I think he, he entered somewhere south of Pacheco. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes, I think that's where the right. fish range to the north, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so anyway, they they had good eating. They had plenty of things. Yes, it was a lot of work. Someone was always cooking. You know, cook, cooking took uh usually a whole community of people mm -hmm. and it took all day, every day, to feed everybody. Mm -hmm. And um they did not all just have their own fires they often had a communal area mm -hmm. where they did a lot of the acorn mush and that kind of stuff because it took so much effort it was like a big group thing and and everybody did it so along with that i will say that when children were young we they were not just taught like yes of course boys were taught to hunt and to fish but they were also taught to cook and to prepare all the cooking. And um, women were not just taught to cook and to put clothing together. Um, they were also taught to hunt and they were also taught to fish because as a community, when, some, when a group went to trade, went off to trade, it often took many of the men and some of the women and the rest of the, the uh, and the men had to do their own prep preparation when they were on the trail and when they were at the ceremonial areas. So they, they were all trained in, in everything. Um, unlike some, some places where they're only trained, people are only trained for the thing that they're gonna do. And they did have specialties. There were specialties, people were better at making the arrowheads. They were specialties. There were people who were in charge of the cooking. So I told you there was a chief. There were also two head women. And the head women actually ran the camp. <laughs> they basically took care of all of the, one of the women was considered the, um, I call her the dance master. She was in charge of all ceremonial dances and the all the clothing for the ceremonial dances, all the planning for it, you know. Um, the other head woman was basically in charge of making sure there was plenty of food. And if there was more need of more something, she would send a group out to get it, men or women. Um, and so they really, and it was, uh, uh, as I said, they didn't have a, and they would have a, a gathering 
and m much was done by by what you can call you could call democracy. They definitely voted on a lot of things and uh, chose things together. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Next. So one of the things that the Miwoks did was they tattooed, mm -hmm. and they um, tattooed themselves. Not um, the the one on the right is is a little more like what I saw in most of the things about the um, Bay Miwoks and the Plains Miwoks. The one on the left is a little more like the Sierra Miwok. They had a little more decoration on the cheek and up. Generally for the um, Miwoks around here, it was all on the chin and lower cheekbone, maybe under the cheekbone. And, and those signs, their, their tattooing was not just decoration. It was meant to show what they were, who they were. It told their status in the tribe or in the tribelet. It told their uh, specialty if they were uh, uh, if they made, you know, if they if the uh, arrowheads were their specialty, if building homes were their specialty, if hunting was their specialty, if fishing was their specialty, if um, they were a head woman or a head man. So so their status. Oh, if they were married and not married, so that it was very much uh, and and one of the for the young men, they had a tat they had a tattoo and. When they got married, they had another tattoo that went on top of the old tattoo oh, that showed oh that God. they were now taken. They, it was very important that they not mess around. <laughs> <laughs> they would get kicked out of the tribalism. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, so, okay, we can go on. Yeah, this one also shows you, uh, these are, these are Bay Miwoks right there. That have been now you notice around the neck of the one on the left side um, there is also some tattooing and tattooing was done to other parts of the body also uh, but it was decorative mm -hmm. they might make a, a bracelet or a wrist tattoo they might make a now the tattooing was done by cutting and then they took the roots of the poison oak and the the roots of the poison oak mm -hmm. when ground up produce a black dye and they would use that and that it is understood that they also ate the berries of poison oak and they um, used poison oak in other things the 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 big debate that's gone on forever and will never be solved <laughs> is whether they uh, fed because they were not allergic to poison oak because they fed their babies things like that from the very beginning? Mm -hmm. um, or was it because there was something genetic about it and they just weren't allergic to poison oak, mm -hmm. like 90% of the rest of us are? 50%. 50 50%. Oh, okay. About 50% if you take it. So that's what, that's what um, so they used that poison oak a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, they probably did. <laughs> and they probably not deep. You just scratch. You're just yeah, scratching. you're just scratching. Just a, a layer of. They'd bring blood. I mean, they needed to open up the mm -hmm. area so they could actually save the tattoo. Mm -hmm. um, Connie. Yes. I was very skeptical about the feeding babies poison oak story until the big study was done of feeding Jewish babies bomba, that peanut candy, uh -huh. and if it starts at four months, it reduces the risk of peanut allergy by about 85%. Uh -huh. wow. So very early feeding can seems to induce tolerance to certain right. energy. Now the mechanisms of allergy to peanut are probably, I thought were different from poison oak, but there you are. Early feeding has been validated in at least one setting for one Interesting. Condition. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. As far as I know, they didn't eat any other part of the poison oak except for the berries. And very uh, poison oak produces a, a red, very small berry. And uh, they did use that when, when it came, came time. Okay. All right, so clothing, you can just take a quick look. Clothing was 
it was somewhat optional most of the time in the hot summertime. Then I don't think that they worried about clothing, but for ceremonies or for any time when they were celebrating or anything special, they all wore clothing. Um, they wore skirts and the skirts might be like the person on the, the young. And I can't tell if these are young girls or they are just women, you know, but anyway, they would wear uh, skins or they would wear grass, different kinds of grass. And you can tell there's lots of grasses. The necklaces primarily were some shells. Shells were very valuable because they had to trade for shells because really they didn't have shells in, in our uh, area. Um, now the whole Delta is full of little clamshells but those little clamshells were not native here originally. So they don't think they had shells that they, but they do, would go definitely to the coast and trade. They would go um, all over the place and they're, they found shells everywhere. Right. So it's like shell mound is a massive pile of yes. shells. So. Well, they would go and trade for the and oysters the and they would the do, ones in you know, abalones and all the, the so, so anyway, you can, um, okay. Baby mugs. so this is typical of the type of jewelry they wore and notice that a lot of it is knots and knots made in grasses. And then they would sometimes take colorful grass, grasses or flowers or whatever, and put them in there. Or on the right is actually a grass necklace with different pieces of rock in it. Um, rock that might be co more colorful than others, just tied into it. Very simplistic, but if you wore several of them, it gave a very nice, you know, and that's what they wore for celebrating. Uh, actually, I think they wore it a lot anyway, all the time. Okay. Sopret root. Soap root was another one that, was like acorns, that was used all the time. Soap root it, actually grows right now everywhere. It's quite wild out in the open space. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the soap root is a bulb. If you dig up the soap root, it looks like an onion, uh, kind of a, sometimes a pretty big onion. And, um, the, and right above the onion, I'm gonna try to get on court. So if it's an onion, and then right above the onion, there are bristles that, are, that come out. And when you first dig up a soap root, you go, oh, these bristles must be thrown away. No, no, they use them for every kind of brush you can imagine. Um, they are tough, but not, not uh, prickly or pointy. <laughs> they don't scratch, but they are stiff enough to be made for brushes. They had to brush out when they ground the acorns um, and they gather up the acorn grindings and put them in their mush then they had to brush out because the sand would then start to accumulate so they were always brushing out their sand they had to brush out the um furs that they got would get full of furs and stuff they brushed those out um they used these for everything they did not use these um primarily for their hair though they're not quite tough enough for hair there's another um thistle actually out in the open space that um, they would use that couldn't be put together. And that was, that was their hairbrushes, the thistles from the open space, um, from the wild. So these, these were the top. Then the soap root would be peeled. And soap root was used for several things. First of all, it's a, it's a poison. Um, and without knowing it, it can make someone very sick probably would not kill them, but make them very sick. It also was used in ponds. They'd throw it into a pond um, and that stunned the fish. Its toxin stuns the fish. The fish float up to the top. They go into the pond. They gather up the big fish. It only lasts for a few minutes. The small fish can swim away. So it was one way they were able to fish without gathering up the babies and the smaller fish. They were very aware of the fact that, especially ponds that were out in, in our area, like in, in the areas that were not in a river, that they were enclosed and that they would um, uh, 
only provide what they had, you know, and if you took the small fish, they weren't going to provide anything the next year. So they were pretty good at conservation. It was just part of life. Yeah, they just peeled it off. You could peel off parts of it. When you get to the interior, you have to break it or smash it. So they would smash it like this. And then that released the toxins and they'd toss it in and the fish would float up to the top. Um, fishing was fishing was quite an art and they had many different ways of fishing. This was one way of fishing in small ponds. They used nets. They used um, hook and lines for certain kinds of fish. They even, they fished for sturgeon, quite large sturgeon, and they would get those on a hook and line. But once they'd caught it, then someone had to go in and, and capture it. It was too strong for what they had and would pull away. So once they got it, then a whole group of <laughs> people would go in and, and grab it and wrestle it to the ground, to the up to the land. Hmm. Um, so, but they had, they could weave, they would uh, braid uh, different kinds of grasses and stuff to make their lines, different kinds of uh, fibers. They could, by weaving, make them pretty strong. And that's how they also did their baskets. They would first weave the grasses and then they could they could do a, a very intricate uh, job of of starting at the base and making. So when I did the Indian days, I always loved it because the kids all wanted to make baskets, and I'd say, "Great, let's do it." And so one of the one of the activities was to make a basket, and they the biggest basket that I ever managed to make was about this big around, <laughs> and it took me about a month of working on it in front of TV a lot. Mm -hmm. So the kids would make the base of their basket and it would maybe be about this bigger by the size of a quarter. And they were so excited, but they would take take all kinds of stuff home with them to finish it at home. I never saw any finished baskets, but, <laughs> but anyway, they did get really into it. I was totally amazed. Um, and they were a coil basket. So they would coil and it would coil around. And But then they wove also in between the coils so that the coils would all st stay together better. All right, next. Okay, these are typical tools. And um, I won't go through all of the tools, but, but all the tools are very all natural stuff. Um, at the bottom center is a, an obsidian arrowhead or spearhead. It's hard to tell the size of it. So, it's and and to the right, there's two more that are for different types of things. So each one had its own use and they had them for birds. They made tiny little arrowheads that were quite beautiful uh, for birds also. Mm. Um, and they, they actually were able to use a lot of, and then they, so this one, the big one was probably for a spear. And typical, you can see the two standing up there, um, uh, B, what's that, A and B. Um, you can see how they split, and then they put the, the arrowhead or the uh, whatever it was in the top of it. Oh, these are actually just used, mm -hmm. these are cutting tools. They would be used at the, uh, in the kitchen mm -hmm. um, for cutting and for that kind of thing. A and B would be cutting tools. Because what they would do with the arrows would be much smaller, much straighter, and they would take them and work them for a long time over a fire to make them straight and to make them tougher. Um, and uh, when they shot an arrow, you know, they show in all of the Indian movies, they show them, but they show Indians. I grew up in, in Apache and Comanche territory. And so that's where they would ride on horses and shoot their arrows at the wagon trains that came, I'm from Missouri, so came from Independence <laughs> and got shot at across Kansas. So anyway, uh, they show them shooting the arrows, <laughs> shooting the arrows, but I guarantee you, they went back and gathered as many of those arrows as they could <laughs> because they worked hard on every arrow. An arrow maker was very, very important because an arrow had to be straight, 
it had to have no notches on it so that as it went through the the bow um it didn't it didn't catch and it had to um be tough you know because you and you didn't just shoot a lot of arrows uh out and not and not go gather them <laughs> so they'd go find it if they could and they clean it up and use it again if they got something anyway so you can also see um the uh up to the right on uh, the x the one that's x that's probably it's hard for me to tell exactly what it is but it's leather of some kind it's leather that's been cured and taken care of probably clothing probably I'm papoose. Guessing. what i would think it'd be a papoose for carrying it yeah leather. possibly a papoose exactly and then um down uh in the middle there where the uh you want to do the this part right here yeah uh this part these are uh grinding these are uh th what they would use they used also rock for grinding though the rocks they used were usually not sandstone stone those were usually of some other type and they would chisel them away these are really well rounded that means they've been used a lot because they started out not being, sometimes they were even square when they started with them. Um, and then these are are more typical of what they use, use, you know, but they use it, this is what you make corn out of too, you know? So anyway, uh, then to the left where it says D, this one up here, that's actually shells, or not shells, seeds, and this is the the stock that's there on this would be a dance a tool for shaker. or a shaker of yeah. some kind oh, yeah. for ceremonies for dancing dancing by the way <laughs> the, the book uh the one of the places that i get a lot of my information that has given me the most actually about the plains miwok and about the bay miwok is a book uh from the smithsonian uh collection and it's called uh, North American Indians, and they have a nice big section on Miwoks. And um, one of the things they say is that Miwoks love to dance. They loved to dance. They danced. If someone died, they danced. If someone didn't die, they danced. <laughs> if um, someone got well from something, they would dance to celebrate it. If someone didn't get well, they danced to mourn it. But mm -hmm. dancing was super important to them. They danced to meet other people. Mm -hmm. So when they would have big ceremony, big uh, gathering for trading and uh, many tribes would come together, tribalets would come together. Dancing was a big, important way that they, I mean, that's not that far off from, from yeah. now. <laughs> you know, dancing is a way to meet people. And uh, that was kind of one of the, the ways they would meet other people eligible people um and they wore their their uh, singleness right on their chin <laughs> and so you know they were looking for for people um so anyway uh the, these are all tools you can sell see they're all natural things that have come from from nature from what they have it's very complicated it's under the um, leather oh uh, yes, W. I'm not sure. I can't tell from here what mm -hmm. that is. My guess is that it's one of the nets that they used nets for many things. They used nets for catching birds. Mm -hmm. They used nets for catching um, fish. They made a lot of nets, and that it, it's you can't really tell, but I'm guessing that's a net. They one of my uh, most interesting one was uh, so deer were plentiful. And they were the biggest amount of meat you could get from one hunt. The next biggest, the next most prolific with meat is, is rabbit. Mm -hmm. Rabbit bones are very small and rabbit fat is very big. So, and rabbit fur is very valuable. So they would have, um, they would go hunting. Sometimes the entire village or the entire tribelet would go hunting for rabbit. And um, they would make a net that was maybe a hundred yards. Some say maybe even as much as 200 yards, but I don't know, you know, but anyway, and they would have people all along this net holding this net and they would make it into a kind of a semicircle. And then they would send 
especially children out into the, uh, you know, brush and into the grasses and into the forest. And they would flush the rabbits out and get the rabbits um, to the uh, to the nets. And then there was always the clubbers and they were usually the young men and they would go in and club the rabbits. Mm. And then they would they all prepare the rabbit fur and the rabbit meat and the, they'd do it together. So rabbits were, were very much a, a part of their entire tribe tribelet would work together on it. Yeah. This is a bamboo whistle. Oh, it's a whistle. Bamboo double oh. whistle was burned in design. Oh, okay. I'm wrong. <laughs> whistle, one of their musical instruments. Musical, another musical Goes instrument. along with the, the I mean. You know he's talking about that one. This one, uh, that one. Okay. So I got to talk about nets, but I don't have a picture of a net, so that's great. <laughs> um, I don't see other things that I that I recognize. Don't know what the one is. F. Did you see F on there? It was B to G, a bundle consisting of three items of four, each used to indicate exactly. cardinal directions. B is a golden eagle tail feather. F is an osher, ochre stained wooden pegs from underground ghost house. Okay. Whoa. The ghost house is is also what the roundhouse was called when when they would do their ghost dance. Ghost dance was I got the impression ghost dance is similar to celebrating Halloween. Yeah. They're uh, uh, similar to uh, uh, the sacred use of sal Halloween, the the Mexican uh, and Spanish uses of of uh mm -hmm. celebrating your ancestors and and um that was called ghost dance and we had that uh, saw that and uh, uh the navajo and the hopi and then later on of course there was a whole resistance movement uh, uh a cult almost uh against the in, us invaders ca uh, called the the ghost dance uh cult. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay next all right, baskets. Uh, again, woven, I told you, notice that this is done in coils and um, the coloring, different different roots of different plants made different colors. So they could actually color it in more than just black. They could color it in other colors too. The Miwok in general were not known for their basket making. They, they were could make baskets. Everybody made baskets. That's what they they used for cooking. That's used. For, they used it for uh, all different things. They used it for carrying. They used it for willow winnowing when they were in the grasses and they had very loose baskets and they could winnow and take and take them and shake them and the seeds would stay inside and the grasses would fall out. But the best baskets were made by the pomos. Pomos were known for their baskets and the ones that you see in museums and in most places are pomo and they are very intricate. They're very tightly woven. This would be considered very rustic compared to the pomos and pomos were uh, north of here. They were up in the like um, Ashton area, uh, Ashland about in that area. Oh, in what? <laughs> yeah, no, the Pomo Pomo Indians were here, and they actually were some of the first Indians to to uh, in California, or in our area of California, to um, uh, make uh, themselves a home, and they made homes and villages literally with streets, and so they had the first town that was a Pomo town was up north of here. And um, so they had a different, and they were not in the Miwok tradition, but um, they would trade. So they would go up there to trade and get the really nice baskets. Um, and then they would consider them to be a, a, a value. Okay, next. That's it. That's it. Okay. so. Um, how are we doing for time? I have not a clue. It's um, five after three. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> oh, wow, we got a little bit of amazing, a late, a late amazing. Start, yeah. Okay, I I do want to um say that there's a 
couple of things that we have to kind of realize. And one is that this area, I didn't realize this until I kind of was doing more research, but the, the, uh, the area in the Plains, Plains Miwok, the area s south of Sacramento and north of San Jose, all of that area was the last of California really to have white men arrive. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that white men came across by, by, uh, by land and they came across by water. They came, they came up and around the, the uh, horn and, and all the way up for trading purposes. But they couldn't find a, a route through the, mount, through the Sierras here. So if they came, like take Lewis and Clark, they wanted to come straight through the Sierras and they ended up going all the way up to the Columbia to, to find a way to the coast. Mm -hmm. Everybody was trying to get to the coast. So many went down and ended up south. Many went, came and ended up north. This was the last area. It was not until gold was discovered that many people came in here other than trappers. Jesus. Fur trappers, fur trappers are not known for their journaling, journaling. So they didn't give us much uh, information, and uh, they did. They weren't even very fur trappers. weren't even very well known for their sense of of knowing where they'd been. They knew their trails. They knew their area. They knew their animals, and they, you know knew they could get a lot of money if they took it back to San Francisco, back to San Diego, back to Seattle, any of those places and, and uh, sold them. So we never had a lot of uh, white uh, people, no, settlers here. We did have ranchos and the ranchos were, were here, but the ranchos were even not very populated. They just had their rancho and their cattle. It was great. <laughs> And the ranchos, when they did come in, they did not really, uh, they were not bothered much by the, by the Indians. Um, yes, Johnny tells me that Marsh, who came in as a, as a uh, basically bought a, a rancho from someone else, he had his cattle rustled. But I would say that they didn't actually, first of all, Indians didn't believe in ownership. So rustling cattle was not something that really to them was stealing because they were cows out in a field <laughs> mm -hmm. and they didn't have, they didn't have fences. There were no fences for cows. That was, and ranchos didn't have fences. Only when farmers came in, when, when white farmers came in, did they start having fences and then they had wars over fences. Mm -hmm. um, but until then, and and the cow and the Indians would just take one or two cows, just enough to fix a meal. <laughs> so they didn't really consider themselves cattle rustlers. Mm -hmm. And most of the rancheros, I think, kind of figured that out and didn't mess with them. Uh, so evidently, I there were hundreds, thousands, actually, of Indians in the whole uh, Could he uh, plains mm -hmm. and in the um, uh, and the here i've heard uh, of 120,000 in, yeah. in the whole state in the whole state which is not no but a lot of the population of was, indians right. was here was here right sorry john. so yeah no the uh, connie mentioned uh, john marsh and because we have a, a, a semi-medical audience here he he was not a doctor but he pretended to be one uh, he was he was the uh, uh, first uh, American uh, to get here, um, the, the first Northern European, if you will, uh, to settle in in this uh, area, uh, and he had been a fugitive uh, uh, that uh, fled from Minnesota. He was a gun runner for for uh, Native Americans, but he had apprenticed with a surgeon in the army in Minnesota. And he he came he came here, uh, hung out his shingle in Los Angeles, collected his uh, stake, and bought this rancho in the eastern part of the county near Brentwood. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing about him, he bought it sight unseen, 
and he got it for a cheap price. And the reason he got it for a cheap price is that the Native Americans that lived on the Delta were hostile to the previous owner, a guy named Noriega. And so John Marsh uh, got here and decided to go out and confront the, the uh, Native American, the Indians, excuse me, the uh, Miwoks, and uh, said, he, what, what, don't rustle in it, your, these cattle anymore. And he, he discovered that they were suffering from a disease that the uh, Spaniards uh, bought in, uh, malaria. And he saw uh, uh, Indians shaking on the ground. He figured that he'd bring some quinine in, and he did, and he ingratiated himself uh, to, to the Indians. Uh, he was at the right place at the right time for the gold rush and put all the cattle that he had on flat boats and uh, made a million dollars uh, and built this big uh, mansion in uh, near Brentwood that's going to be a state park someday. <laughs> so uh, speaking of a doctor, I did not mention the medical situation of these um, of the Miwoks. They did not have uh, they did have a shaman. But the shaman really was about blessing things and about um, um, teaching. He, the shaman was the person who taught others how to pick out medicines and so forth. There were many doctors in a tribelet. There were those that were responsible for um, like fevers. There were those that were responsible for, and they would learn from the shaman what what roots and what plants and what medicine to take and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there were only really two things that, I mean, obviously infection had to be something that that mm -hmm. happened a lot. They also had uh, illnesses of different kinds. Um, and until the missions came in, they really didn't have a lot of the uh, big, big illnesses, but they, and the Miwok, by the way, were taken to the San Jose mission many of the, especially the Bulbones, the B-O-L-B-O-N-E-S that lived here, right here, the tribelet that went from up here down to Walnut Creek and back up here, they um, were taken into the San Jose mission, but they escaped. All of them worked together and they all escaped and they came back out here. And whenever the missionaries or their, their soldiers from the mission would come, they would just disappear, according to the records. They were very good at hiding and very good at um, escaping the, uh, the, the mission. And so they gave up on them. They stopped even trying to, to put them in a mission. So they- Tell the story about the, how Mantiablo got its name. Okay. Well, let me finish this one thing. So I wanted to talk about, they had basically, they had two things they re really worried about. One was illness and one was poison. Poisoning was a very common way to die. And poisoning could be done just by accident because they picked the wrong berries or there was a lot of experimentation going on, obviously. They had to eat all, the, they ate everything. They ate stalks of things. They had berries of things, roots of things. and. Some things you couldn't eat the root because it was poisonous, but you could eat the berries and you couldn't eat this and you couldn't eat that. But so, so that was, there was a doctor who was entirely in charge of what was poisonous, letting people know what was poisonous and what wasn't. But also poisoning was the way that they took care of anybody that they didn't want in their <laughs> tribe or in their family or in their, if they, if there was a dispute and the shaman determined the dispute and the and somebody didn't wouldn't go along with it and they wouldn't leave the tri leave then they would eventually within not very long be poisoned by somebody because they would hire someone within the tribe to actually poison them <laughs> so that was one of their ways of getting rid of yeah, here's your job. You're in charge of poison. That's, but that was right. Poisoner, special poisoner. Anyway, so that was that was really well. So Mount Diablo is a 
is a uh, one of one kind of an interesting one because um, so the the last of the bulbones, the last of the of the Miwoks, um, when after having died of famine or not famine, they never died of famine. They always had food, but having uh, died of uh, different diseases brought in by the missions, and uh, then the soldiers the from the cavalry. Finally, after the cavalry decided that we got to get rid of these Indians and they would put them into into the missions. Well, the Bobones didn't want to be caught, so they went up on Mount Diablo and they hid up on Mount Diablo and um, they would have fires at night. And that was where it got its name, Mount Diablo, Devil Mountain, because they were sure that the devil lived up there because if soldiers went up there they seldom came back maybe they got poisoned i don't know <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any records of what happened to them and they also don't have any real records of what happened to the last of the bulbones after they were up there chances are very good that they went down the east side of mount diablo and uh, perhaps disappeared in with other tribes because there's the there was never a a reservation there was never anything like that most california tribes never got any land or any real uh, compensation for their where they were because they didn't believe in ownership they didn't have territory and therefore they didn't demand territory when they could have probably so the, they were pretty much left to there are, there are a few reservations up in Northern California, right. yeah. the Yurok al along the Klamath right. River. Yeah. Their reservation is a half mile on the other side of the Klamath uh, River, right. wherever the Klamath River decides to go. Right. And then there's there's other smaller reservations right. up there. But you'll notice there's no reservations in the no no Miwok reservations of any kind. Well, I don't think that anybody went to search for them. <laughs> I don't think they they actually wanted to go up there. It was pretty, you know, treacher pretty treacherous. Um, there, besides being very dense forests, then the other parts are pretty pretty sheer rocks, a lot of sheer drops. So, I don't think that there was a lot of effort made because really what they wanted to do was get them out of here. Get them out of where the people wanted to settle. So the, once they the disappeared, yeah, the prime land. They once they disappeared, nobody really worried about them very much. I think. <laughs> anyway, so that's. That I, yes. Uh huh. So earlier when you were talking about possession. Yes. So is that a hereditary? Was that a, you know, meritocracy? No. Was that? No. From from what I understand, um, and from what is kind of written um they did not have anything that passed down because of who you were because you were the son of the shaman however you were voted into that position and um so it was often they might be a relative but it wasn't because they were a relative because it was a big fam i mean it was primarily family that were in these triblets Mm -hmm. They did not marry within their tribelet. They always married outside of their tribelet. Um, and they, uh, so. They have, so. So if they married out, was it the woman that then went on to the. To the, the woman went to the men's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But there were two women who were. Two, two, two head, two head women. Were, yeah. The chief and two head women. And the two head women had had their own jobs, yeah. Right. And then there was the shaman who who was the medicine man kind of, but he wasn't like considered to be the the he was the wise one. They right. called him the wise one. Yes, yes. And he taught the young younger ones coming on. When the chief got old, old enough, they would the chief and the two head women would then train mm. someone that had been chosen to be the next chief. And they would train that person. And then when they got the person trained, the chief would uh, back out. And if he didn't back out, 
<laughs> they hired someone to poison him. <laughs> so uh, they took care of that easily. They didn't uh, <laughs> didn't ever have a problem with yeah population management. Yes, uh, right, right. Okay. Any uh, uh, any questions, questions? Out, out in Zoom land? So I will say that they the, there was a I I wanted to bring up one of our neighbors here participated in a dig, and mm -hmm. uh, she she did an ar archaeology class at um, uh, DVC, and I was hoping that she would be available today, but she wasn't available. So uh, Diablo Valley College had an archaeology class. They did it out, if you know the area, it was out by Boundary Oaks um, Golf Course, um, just above Boundary Oaks, actually right where the, the police firing range is right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's where the dig was. Mm -hmm. And the dig was there because there had been, somebody on a hike had found a, a couple of arrowheads and kind of things like that. And so that, they got permits to, to dig there. And they did, they, it was a great class. She loved the class. She learned all about everything. They didn't find very much. She called it detritus that they found, mm -hmm. which is small pieces of things. Um, and so, but it got shut down when they found a skull. And they, the first people you have to call is the police. So the police have to come and they have to, uh, determined so they called in an archaeologist who had to determine the the, the age of this skull right. and it came from about the year 2000 bc yeah the year 2000 i forget that <laughs> we're in 2000 yeah. now yeah so the year 2000 bc and um so it was very old and then the next person they have to call the indian whatever Bureau Indian Affairs. Yes. yes and the person who who came and i have met i have had a run-in with this very same person <laughs> and he's mostly mexican actually he's he's got just a very small amount of indian in him but he has managed to get himself appointed to being the head guy mm -hmm. on all digs and all things he shut down a lot of things and uh he uh he calls himself Aloni. But when you look up Aloni, it's not anywhere around here. Aloni is a Costanoan language. So Costanoan languages are all on the coast, obviously. And they're actually north of the coastal Miwok. The coastal Miwok did not speak the same language as most of the Costanoan languages. I thought Costanoan was south. Costanoan was south, was south, yeah. South. Yeah. So anyway, on the, but on the coast, but on the coast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, on the coast, yeah. and Ohlone are not mentioned at all, even in that. But they are a Costanoan language. So anyway, he has now mended himself. So he, they put concrete on top of this dig, on top of the the, and and it's it's done. They've wow. they've cemented it in. Well. They did. They they stopped the whole class. They stopped the dig. They stopped everything. That was the oh. end of that. Oh. Harold had a question on uh, the size of a triblet. Yes. Tri triblets. Triblets were anywhere from about fifty people to, I mean, at their at their at their prime, they were fifty to two hundred, about that kind of a size. Toward the end, they were twenty to 40 mm -hmm. you know i mean they got what okay. got killed off in different ways in the case of ishi it went down to one yeah. yes when was the bounty put on on uh yeah made on the uh, indigenous yeah. peoples because it was like an 18 1880s 70s 80s i, they, I think so they actually put a five dollar uh, head for the scalps yeah that was the story that's all in the ishi the the yeah. details of, of that along with that that massacre on the island um off of eureka uh yeah there, there was a, 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 a massive, the, a massive the, extermination right animals. right and and certainly that shows there's a lot of different different stories but here was not disturbed by they didn't have a hunting for the indians they didn't have um in the bay area in the bay area there's more than us yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. So are there are there people that consider themselves to be Walsh? Is there a percentage to know that you have to be Walsh? There's one thirty one sixty four. I don't know what the percentage is. There is a percentage that, that you're supposed to, yeah, and it's not a very big percentage because this is true all over the uh, United States that there is a, yeah, universal thing of how much you can I think to it was be claimed. Yeah. I think it's one, yeah. Still hard to get. Still hard, yeah, hard yeah. to get. But I, because I work for, I mean, you work for them, but it wasn't 116. I think, I think well, oh, you're yeah. great, great to, to be your considered great, an Indian great grandfather, one of your great great grandparents. You mean to get benefits to from get benefits the in, from Indian from Health Service, Indian health for instance. Yeah, 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 I think was, it was 132nd. But 132nd, maybe, yeah. Very small, though. Yeah. yeah. You're right. right. Well, now maybe now we DNA. Genetics. Yeah. That's right. Now we have 23 and me. Yeah, so that's it's changed yeah. game. Elizabeth Warren <laughs> learned, right. learned that. Yeah. So you know the the, the uh, our local uh, paleontologist who gave lectures three and four in the in in this series has to deal with uh, 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 this this guy who holds himself oh. to be mm -hmm. the Andrew. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. He mentions Andrew. And, <laughs> no one loves Eric. And Andrew. the biggest story of a, uh, uh, Andrew, his biggest coup egotist. was halting the building of the Emeryville shopping mall for, for the Shell Mound. Uh, for for uh, yeah, for the Shell Mound right. because they they discovered excavating the Shell Mound for the shopping center that there were uh, uh, burial sites, which was the uh, a practice, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this guy single-handedly uh, shut down a major multi-million dollar uh, development. And if you go uh, em to Emeryville, to the mall, you will see part of the memorial that was, that was the final agreement that mm -hmm. You can have a memorial. You can you can have your shopping mall, but you've got to have this memorial in perpetuity, and uh, I, you have to put flowers on there every every so often. So uh -huh. there's a flower shop in the Emory Film Mall. But, yeah. yeah. So are the Indians happy with Andrew? And what are you doing? I don't know any Indians who actually know Andrew. <laughs> right, well. Andrew doesn't live. He 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 lives in Moraga, <laughs> so he's not. Um, <laughs> he's quite wealthy. Actually. Oh, is he? Yes. Right. Yep, he makes a lot of money with. Uh, I think then that there would be Indians who would be available to do digs then because you know, they, were, it is their people. In right. Some way. But I think they, they don't they don't want them dug up. I mean, no. the Indian is once they're in the ground, they're part of the earth. You yeah. don't bring them back out. Right. That's part of my understanding of yeah. so they that may be why they cement cap. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so what, okay. how does all this information get written down? What? You seem to know a lot of detail about how this tribes were put together. Well, a lot of information was they actually the Smithsonian talks about a, a man and a woman that they talked to who were who were descendants, but who also had had knew the languages and had heard stories through their through their parents and grandparents and so forth so so that's some of the information a lot of the information was also trappers did talk about things mm -hmm. and uh and then a lot of uh once the the white explorers were here there were still indians here and they did do a lot of talking to them about how they did things and so forth so Easy. Ishi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are a few that survived and, and mm -hmm. hung in there and gave information. Well, and there have been, I know, revisions of how long people have been here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm reading Kim um, Carlson Richardson's book about the High Sierra, and he has a whole chapter, and he talks about that they used to think it was only a few thousand years, but now there's evidence that they may have come back. And I don't, I don't, I, read, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's here. But certainly in the Clovis find was, mm -hmm. was about 13,000 years mm -hmm. ago. So there have been revisions of what yeah. we thought well, they We, we covered also, all this last la, la, uh, last week. So the, the first the, were, were the paleo uh, coastal uh, culture. 
And then um, the uh, Clovis came in much later. Um, like the Clovis came in early to New Mexico, but they never came across to California right. until maybe 10,000 years ago. You know, we have uh, Vas Vasco Caves in the eastern yeah, part. Yeah, that's 8,000. Okay. Right. So yeah, that's 8,000. 8, and, okay. and so uh, you kind of work your way yeah, down. And, was, yeah. So, yeah, we got 2,000 yeah. here. So I want to thank Connie. Uh, for, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, unless there's a burning issue, I'm going to stop recording and then we can uh, uh, have informal chatter. Speak now, Ron. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>